Hey guys, welcome back again for another episode, Daily Show, today for August 10, a Tuesday episode. It's really nice to see you guys again, and I'm excited, I'm excited to uh, share you guys what we're going to be talking about today. So I guess without further ado, let's go ahead and move to our today's observances. Let's go ahead and start. First up, we have... World Lion Day. Uh, this celebration of one of animals or animal kingdom's most beautiful and fearsome creature was founded by Big Cat Rescue, uh, the world's largest accredited sanctuary dedicated to big cats. And you know, big cats. Uh, that category also includes panthers, the uh, tigers, the leopards. You know. Basically, any any cat that you don't usually see at home. There you go. They're more like in the wild. So, uh, but for today though, just specifically for lions, and I'm sure other cats will have their own um, observance. Uh, but today is the day, not just to celebrate this uh, wild cat or these wild cats, because yeah, that's more than one. Um, but also to be reminded uh, to be aware about their population. So I, I know they're not, you know, there's not just uh, one single lion left in the world, but their population, generally speaking, are uh, declining. Um, so their numbers are, have been declining and being placed on the endangered list. Together with other members of the big cat family, uh, so when it comes to um, populations de uh, population decline a lion is not just by themselves but other big cats also so even though this can be a fun and exciting uh, occasion for all its foundation are based in a very serious matter um, speaking of the observance itself the initiative in 2013 uh, started in 2013 bringing together both National Geographic and the Big Cat Initiative under a single banner to protect the remaining big cats uh, living in the wild. Now going back to the lions since today is their day their scientific name is Panthera Leo and they're the second if you guys are thinking lions would be the biggest member of the big cat family well they're just the second largest cat because the first one was actually the Asian tiger yes they're bigger um, these immense creatures weighing between 300 to 550 pounds have sparked a popular imagination for centuries inspiring awe through their speed and muscular power um, according to researchers three million years ago um, lions roamed all over um, Africa and the Eurasian supercontinent. But today, various ice ages and uh, changes in the natural environment means that their range is reduced primarily to Africa and select parts of Asia. According to the International Union for the Conversation, oh, conversation Conservation of Nature, Lions are a vulnerable species, meaning that their numbers could and should be higher. Um, currently, researchers estimate that there are only between 30,000 to 100,000 lions left um, here in this world. So again, you might find these numbers, you know, like 30,000 to 100,000 uh, to be still a lot. But as far as the population is concerned, that's not really a lot. I mean, imagine just having over or just up, you know, having up to 100,000 uh, humans left on Earth. That's less than the population here in California, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, there are generally three objectives for this observance. Um, the first is to raise awareness of the uh, plight of the lion and the issues that the species face in the world in the wild. The second, though is to find ways to protect the big cat's natural environment because like we always like what we always uh discuss here in our daily show us humans kind of tend to uh affect other animals or affect other uh living things by destroying their habitat you know but it, it, it could be either 
uh, consciously we're aware that we're doing it or we're not aware that we're doing it. That's why these reminders or these observance, for me, I think they're a very good reminder that, uh, what was I been saying uh, every time? Oh, that uh, we're not uh, by ourselves here. I mean, we're not the only ones living in this planet, you know. Um, the third uh, objective of this observance is to educate people who live near wildcats. Uh, that's probably not me. Or no, that's definitely not me because I don't see any lions here. Um, on the dangers and how to protect themselves. Of course, well, uh, we we. we we ourselves don't want to get in trouble or we ourselves don't want to get hurt by these wild animals. We gotta also uh, learn or realize that they're wild animals and they might not be able to understand that us and uh, it could attack us. So we gotta be careful and we gotta take care of ourselves. Humans and large species like cats, however, can live in harmony together if we understand each other. That's the thing. I mean, you know. Um, even we just between us humans if we don't understand each other there's always going to be conflict and there's going to be misunderstanding also a good way to celebrate this observance is to learn some interesting facts about them um, so i got some interesting facts um, that you may or you may not know yet did you guys know lions can eat up to 90 pounds of meat? Wow, that's a lot. I, I mean, the same goes for the rest of the big cat family because they're big cats. They have a big diet. Uh, also, in a lion's family, the female lion is the one doing the hunting, at least most of the time. Uh, the male lions, they also do hunting, but pretty much like just for themselves. The female lion is actually hunting for... Or the female lions are actually hunting for for the family or for the uh, the pride their group um, so I guess it, you can say that most of the time the male lions will be uh, pretty much lazing around <laughs> so, um, but I, I guess not uh, you know uh, the, they should be doing something yeah uh, and speaking of lazing around or I guess relaxing you know they have a very long relaxation time in general the lions um, whether it be male or female, they spend between 16 to 20 hours a day resting and sleeping. Wow, talking about uh, weekend, huh? It's like everyday weekend for them. Uh, you know why? Because maybe, just maybe, that's, this is not actually the, the reason why, but I'm guessing maybe because they like celebrating this next observance. I kind of just segue it there. <laughs> and our next observance is National Lazy Day. Um, but just to make it clear, lions, they're not celebrating this observance, you know. So, National Lazy Day. Um, first of all, if you ask me, this observance is kind of, kind of weird to be on a Tuesday. Um, I mean, I get it that you, you start feeling lazy over the weekend, right? I mean, I do. I don't know about you guys, but I do, especially uh, my body, when it's Friday, my body already knows that, hey, it's Friday, so time to relax, slow it down. That's that's what's happening to me on a Friday afternoon or Friday evening, you know. Uh, but on a Tuesday, nah, I'm, I'm, I'm in my work mode, I'm in my uh, busy mode, you know, because it's Tuesday. Uh, but I guess if you're working over the uh, weekend and your day off happened to be Tuesday, then hey, there you go. Something you can celebrate, I guess. Anyways, the thing is, there are so many holidays throughout the uh, the year that people celebrate by doing things that take effort. So, I mean, you know, like there's a there should be an observance uh, that we talked about before for running. Not sure about swimming, if ever I haven't talked about swimming specifically, but maybe one of the teachers had an observance about swimming. But hey, we even have observance for taking down Christmas trees, just saying, you know, and cooking. Yeah, cooking, definitely. I mean, we got, how do you say, we got, we, we got a lot of food observances. So some of those observances are, are easier to do when you cook it instead of buying them, you know? So sometimes it can get uh, a little bit too much, 
So people ask this one question, can't there be just a day to be lazy and do nothing? I would say yes, actually more than one, it's, uh, it's, it's Saturdays and Sundays. I'm kidding, um, because what I do most of the time, Saturday, I'll be uh, cleaning the house, you know, doing my daily chore, doing laundry, dusting things, computer, making sure it's clean because I keep using, you know, because I've been using it. And then Sunday is the one that I just feel like, like this, like, <laughs> like this in the picture right here, just uh, lay in the couch or in the bed and then watch some Netflix or Disney Plus or HBO, you name it. Um, so today is National Lazy Day. Hey, I'm just you know giving you guys the uh, the observances so you can sit back, relax, and enjoy. Or actually, you can enjoy by watching this uh, show too. If uh, you know, just if you don't, if you can't decide of a TV show or movie you want to watch, maybe you can watch this episode for today. So you guys relax while I do the rest. Um, how do you celebrate this observance? Well, pretty obvious like I said, by just doing nothing. But if you want to be a little bit more fancy, you can do the following. First, you can be, you can try uh, laying in a hammock, you know, if you do have one in your backyard or if you're by the, if you live by the beach, that would be awesome. And then instead of cooking, uh, ordering food and then drinking some nice beverages, you know, uh, watching your favorite TV show, just like what I said a while ago or movie, or this observe of oh, this observance, this episode of the Daily Show. Just a reminder, though, uh, it's called Lazy Day, National Lazy Day, not week or not National Daily Month. <laughs> so keep it in one day. I know it could be tempting sometimes, especially if you've been busy for the whole week. Uh, yeah, you might want to. I mean, your body would probably want to extend the uh, relaxation but hey you know again in everything that we do gotta have to have some moderation you know and obviously right now i'm not uh celebrating it because i'm doing this daily show for you guys which i don't mind by the way all right next up our uh, last observance that we're going to be talking about, we got s'mores talking about relaxing. Relaxing a campfire sounds good, but uh, only if you're not going to do it by yourself. It, it's always better to have a group in a campfire, right? Anyways, National S'mores Day recognizes the most popular campfire treat. Uh, millions of people of all ages love this gooey toasted treat. Um, s'mores consists of a roasted marshmallow with a layer of chocolate bar sandwiched between two pieces of graham crackers but I shouldn't have explained that because I'm pretty sure all of our students already know what a s'mores is and uh, I'm pretty sure most of you if not all enjoy s'mores but what you may not know is the origin the origin of this tasty snack is credited to the entrepreneur Alec Barnum um, however, the first recorded version of the uh, recipe can be found in the 1927 publication of Tramping and Trailing with the Girl Scouts. Even though the Girl Scouts were not the first ones to make s'mores, Girl Scout groups described them in their reports as early as 1925. Um, early recipes used the name Some Moors. So, you get the idea on how to get the name or how how the term s'mores uh came into place you know though it is unclear when the word s'mores became a more common name but i mean s'mores some mores because you want some more because it's a pretty tasty treat today many variations on the uh, original s'mores uh find their way around the campfire and you can also try uh these new variations too in case you haven't tried it yet um if you're not allergic to any peanut butter try spreading spreading peanut butter on the graham crackers before adding the other ingredients Ooh, that i think that idea was good it is good you know substitute peanut butter cups in place of chocolate bar ah oh, another good idea and then you can also try to replace the graham crackers with fudge dipped cookies 
Um, but that's probably gonna be too sweet. I mean, I, I would rather keep the uh, graham crackers for myself if I'm gonna add peanut butter chocolate bar, you know? And here's another thing that is also good that, for me personally, add banana slices. Yes, banana slices, is pretty cool. Um, so my question to you guys, do you like s'mores? Um, you can leave your thoughts in the comment section below. Let's move on to today in history. So for today, we're going to be talking about the Louvre Museum opening in 1793. There you go. Um, after more than two centuries as a royal palace, the Louvre is opened as a public museum in Paris by the French Revolutionary government. Today, the Louvre's collection is one of the richest in the world with artworks and artifacts representative or representing about 11,000 years of human civilization and culture. Wow, 11,000 years. That's a lot of collection right there. Or not rather a lot in terms of quantity, but like in terms of, uh, of the time. That's, that's a very long time, 11,000 years. That's pretty awesome. Uh, the Louvre Palace was begun by King Francis I in 1546 on the site of a 12th century uh, fortress built by King Philip II. Francis was a great art collector and the Louvre was to serve as his royal residence. The work, which was supervised by the um, architect Pierre Lescott, um, continued after Francis' death and into the reigns of King Henry II and Charles IX. Almost every subsequent French monarch extended the Louvre and its grounds, and major additions were made by Louis XIII and Louis XIV in the 17th century. Both of these kings also greatly expanded the crown's art holdings, and Louis XIV acquired the art collection of Charles I of England after his execution in the English Civil War. In 1682, uh, Louis XIV moved his court to Versailles, or I think it's called Versailles. Uh, wait, no, I think it's Versailles. Yeah, sorry, my bad. And the Louvre ceased to be the main royal residence. Uh, so if you're interested in visiting this museum, um, right now it's kind of hard to do, especially, you know, you have to travel, especially if you're from here. Uh, the good news, though, is that they actually have a an interactive virtual tour available online where you can visit all quarters of the museum uh, of the museum and see the magnificent pieces of art. I tried going there. Uh, I tried visiting the website. I actually forgot, but maybe I can link the website later at the end of the episode. Um, but yes, they do have this interactive um, tour, virtual tour online. So you can click on a spot or one corner and the website is going to bring you there and you can check amazing artworks, amazing pieces of, uh, of art, basically. All right, for the uh, notable figure born today, we got Henry Nestle in 1814. So, pop quiz, does his name sound familiar? You should, especially if you're watching TV or you're buying uh, food products, you know, in general. So, um, Nestle is best remembered as a confectioner and founder of the world's largest food beverage company, Nestle, or food and beverage company. Um, the origins of his company came from Nestle's concern for the high rate of infant mortality. In 1867, he developed a milk-based uh, milk food for babies who were unable to breastfeed. Uh, popularly known today now as a Sweden condensed milk. And so he's our uh, notable figure born today, Mr. Henry Nestle. Okay, time to move on to our place of the week. And today, or at least this week, we're going to Nicaragua. Um, and since today's Tuesday, national symbols. First off, we have the turquoise browed motma. Um, this bird should be familiar to you guys already since we talked about it back in May as one of the uh, national animals for our place of the week, which is El Salvador. So if you guys don't remember, uh, back in May we talked about uh, turquoise brad motmot as the animal. But that time, it was the animal 
or national animal of El Salvador. Uh, this brightly colored bird can uh, be easily remembered or recognized by its long, light blue tail. Motmots eat mostly insects, and they oddly dig a hole to lay their eggs. They can be seen in forests uh, through Nicaragua also, mostly in the southwest uh, of the country. So, as far as the uh, physical appearance of the bird, the bird is approximately more than a foot long, 13, 13 inch long, and weighs about 2.3 ounces. Uh, it has a mostly green uh, to blue body with a uh, rufous back and belly. Um, and their lifespan would be an average of 20 years for both uh, being in the wild and in captivity. Next up, we have the national flower right here. Um, it's called the Sakuan Jo She or Sakuan Jo Che. Yeah, uh, it grows. Th this flower grows on a conical tree uh, that flowers around May. Um, this flower is most fragrant at night, and in order to lure uh, sphinx moth to pollinate them, uh, the flowers have no nectar and simply dupe their pollinators. Um, unlike other flowers, the uh, Sakuan Jo Che or Sakuan Jo She uh, are intensely fragrant and have different scents. Each variety smells unique and many sweet and spicy scents are noted, uh, <clears throat> such as citrus and peach, jasmine, uh, gardenia, honeysuckle, coconut, and rose. Uh, Sakuan Jo She are most uh, fragrant at night to attract, you know, like a while ago, the Sphinx Moth to basically pollen. And then, uh, let's see what else we have. Oh, yeah, the uh, sports and games this time. Uh, we're going to be talking about these three pictures that you guys see on the screen. The most popular sport in Nicaragua is baseball on the furthest left. Uh, and baseball diamonds can be found throughout the country. Um, another thing is boxing. Boxing has grown in popularity largely in response to the uh, success of the Nicaraguan fighter Alexis Arguello. Um, other preferred sports include uh, soccer or football, um, weightlifting, and swimming. And then the third one is also another popular pastime in Nicaragua, uh, chess, right there. Um, some additional information about their sports or sports history in Nicaragua. Uh, during the Sandinista regime, the government made a particular effort to promote sports among women. Uh, and then Nicaragua made its first Olympic appearance in 1968 at the Mexico City Games. There you go. And that is it for our place of the week. We are moving on to our stuff of the day right over there now we're gonna be talking about does he look familiar abu from the uh disney's animated film aladdin right there that is abu i keep pointing in the wrong direction right there because because my camera is like mirrored so if i point to my left it actually points to the the video's left too i guess all right so um abu is uh, based from an animal from a monkey called the capuch capuchin monkey and the actual picture is right here there you go that's the actual picture of a capuchin monkey capuchin monkeys are little compared to other primates they can only reach like 12 to 22 inches in length and weight uh, of about three between three to nine pounds uh, they have a prehensile tail that is uh, the same length uh, as their body uh, and speaking of their body the body of a capuch capuchin monk or monkey oh my gosh uh, now i said monk the body of a capuchin monkey is covered with fur that is white or light tan on the face uh, neck and shoulders and dark brown on the remaining parts of the body so because of their look um, they are actually named that way because they look like the the one that I just mispronounced or mis uh, labeled a while ago the Spanish capuchin monks um, with their white face and dark brown robes and hoods uh, on the head now going back to the capuchin monkeys 
They are omnivores. A majority of their diet consists of uh, fruits, leaves, seeds, berries, flowers, and buds. They also eat insects, spiders, oysters, birds, and other small mammals and eggs. Um, capuchin monkeys are highly intelligent animals. They could actually use different kinds of tools such as uh, sticks, branches, or stones to open shells, nuts, and hard seeds. So they're pretty cool animals, pretty intelligent animals. They spend most of their life in the treetops where they can find food and avoid predators like giant snakes, uh, jaguars, uh, hawks, and eagles. And uh, speaking of avoiding the predators, uh, capuchin monkeys use special type of warning calls, which kind of sounds more of a, like a sharp whistling to alarm the other members of the group in case there's a danger. Now they also have like the purr, purring sound, you know. Uh, they produce it when monkeys greet each other. Instead of saying, what's up? Or, hey, how's it going? Like the YouTube way of uh, introducing your video to people, I guess. <laughs> okay, uh, lastly, capuchin monkeys live an average of 50 years in both uh, captivity and in the wild. Of course, given that they don't get hunted by the other predators. For our summer plant of the day, we have the penstemon. Penstemon is a low maintenance plant with long blooming vibrant flowers in blue, violet, uh, purple, or right now it's more like a purple picture right there. Uh, they also come in red, uh, pink, or white. Uh, flowering lasts for several weeks in late spring to mid summer, depending on the variety. Um, excuse me. <laughs> Plant in full sun to heart shade in well-drained uh, soil. So if you wanted to grow some penstemon, that's where you're supposed to be uh, planting him. Uh, that had to achieve repeat blooms. There you go. Alrighty, moving on to our musical of, uh, musical artist of the day. Uh, we're doing Whitney Houston for the whole month. The next song we're going to be talking about is I Will Always Love You in 1992. Right there. Don't please don't ask me to sing it, okay? That's one of my favorite songs. But don't let me don't ask me to sing it. Just sing. Okay, the thing though is that this song uh is not a Whitney Houston original. Okay? This song I Will Always Love You is a song written and originally recorded in 1973 by Americans singer-songwriter Dolly Parton. Her country version of the track was released in 1974, the next year, uh, as a single and was written as a farewell to her former business partner and mentor of seven years, uh, Porter Wagoner. Um, following Parton's decision to leave the Porter Wagoner show and pursue a solo career. Um, though it was Though it wasn't a Whitney Houston original, her version, however, of the song for the 1992 film The Bodyguard spent a then record-breaking 14 weeks at number one um, on the Billboard Hot 100 chart and is one of the best-selling singles of all time. Additionally, it holds the record for being the best-selling single by a woman in music history. Houston's version of I Will Always Love You re-entered the charts in 2012 after she passed away, uh, making it the second single ever to reach the top three on the Billboard Hot 100 in separate chart runs. Yeah, um, so we just discussed or we, ju we just talked about how this is not actually Whitney Houston's original song, right? Yeah, this, I mean, she made a version of it. Um, so for me, I wouldn't say Whitney Houston's version of this song is better than the original. Uh, you know, because um, the other one, the original one's a country uh, genre and hers more like a pop. So uh, I think one is not better than the other. It's just two different um, genres. So I would advise for you to enjoy whichever genre you prefer, right? If you prefer country, hey, then Dolly Parton's version might be better for you. If not, uh, you can do Whitney Houston. But for me, I think both versions are good. Are great, rather, sorry. Are great. There you go. 
they're absolute actually oh there you go <laughs> that's that's my segue right there i should have done better on the segue i'm gonna say you know dolly parton and miss houston's version they're absolute and speaking of absolute word of the day absolute uh, this is an adjective this verb verb wait what verb no this word is an adjective uh, let me spell it out for you it's a b s o l u t e absolute and by the way this word is an adjective not a verb i do apologize for me randomly saying words out of nowhere but anyways um, it means free from imperfection uh, it could also mean complete or perfect you know absolute right there the absolute no deficiency or something no so um an example sentence down there is with uh team green celebrated after their absolute victory against team orange right there and those teams didn't have anything to do with our uh thursday virtual sports team because we're doing blue and red and lastly we have our tech trivia did you guys know the first product that was scanned was a packet of chewing gum now uh, when I say scan I'm talking about the uh, the thing that you scan on the products the barcode so Norman Joseph Woodland invented the barcode and received a patent in October of 1952 and then it wasn't until 22 years later when he was employed by IBM uh, that the barcode was developed to be used for product labeling so since then, uh, things that we buy at Walmart, Target, any kinds of stores will have a UPC or the Universal Product Code. There you go. And the very first product that was scanned was, this is not the exact picture, I'm just giving you guys an idea. It's a packet of chewing gum. There you go. Uh, that was, again, that was in 1974. And yeah, I mean, up until now, we're still using that technology, the uh, universal product code. Now, the, the product code ha or product codes, they have a number of advantages to businesses and consumers. I mean, you know, they make it possible for barcode scanners to immediately identify the product and then its associated price. So generally, the UPC actually improves speed into getting more information about the product. Um, they also improve efficiency and productivity by eliminating the need to manually enter the product information that will that could also cause uh, mistakes you know for the product so there you have it um, piece of history also just saying and that is the end of our show today guys hope you low hope you low see I'm having some problems talking today guys i do apologize but hope you like it hope you learned something new and as usual don't forget to leave your thoughts about the topics we discussed in the comment section below i mean we talked about lions we're talking we talked about uh taking it easy having some lazy day you know and then s'mores and then we talked about the louvre museum uh mr nestle you know we got abu uh from aladdin uh let's see what else oh the word absolute right there there you go and many more so i really hope you guys uh, learned something today and as usual uh yeah i'm gonna have to say goodbye for now and i'll see you on thursday